thank you, thank you for um, sort of uh, 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 humoring me to have me here. Um, so just, so who, who is this Devin guy from New York City? What is he doing here? Um, I'll just tell you uh, why I'm here and then, and then we can have a, a discussion um, among the two of us and then we'll open it up to the, to the audience as well. Um, I, I've been specializing in, in Japan uh, sort of social, political, economic change for about um, 15 years or so. And um, I've been running a, a 100th anniversary uh, uh, project at Carnegie Council in New York City taking me and our, and our centennial chair, Michael Ignatia from Harvard, um, he and I have been going around the world to about, we went to eight countries and uh, looking at social change and how people basically fight for their rights. It's very interesting that the word human rights hasn't actually come up. It's more like about justice, uh, respect, dignity, things like, things like that, access fairness, things like that, you know. So I was going around the world looking at all these countries and I, I noticed that there are similar changes going on throughout the world. And essentially people are becoming more worldly and I would say more liberal in the classical sense of the word, meaning that they embrace some elements of individualism and, and um, equality. I know that sounds like a very East Coast thing to say, uh, so I, I understand you might be skeptical, but we can talk about it. Uh, so I asked myself, um, well, w what about the country that I specialized in, Japan? I wondered, you know, are there similar um, uh, uh, changes taking place in this great country? That's so fascinating to me. So I, I came back to Japan um, over the course of the past two years and interviewed more than 100 people in Japan. Um, and I'm on my third trip now interviewing another 50 or so on, on entrepreneurship. The first uh, uh, trip focused on social uh, uh, innovators. The second um, trip focused on gender and uh, uh, basically getting women to have more voice in the economy and more power, more influence. And then the third, um, the third trip is, is focusing on entrepreneurship, and if I if I'm if I get the grant to do a fourth one, uh, I will I will focus on education. And so why why are the, why are these four things um, and why am I looking at these things? Because among Japan watchers like me, a lot of them, the conventional wisdom is nothing's changing in Japan. Have you guys heard that expression? Has anybody heard it? Nothing's changing in Japan. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's familiar, right? But it's lazy. Of course, things are, changing, things are always changing everywhere, right? And Japan's not an outer space in some kind of vacuum. So it has to change. It's, the, it's, the, it's, the, it's, the, it's the sort of, it's like a river, you know? It's like, it's, it's constantly changing, yeah? It's sort of um, metaphysical or, or physiological. So um, how do you investigate change in a society? So what, what my, my method has been to do is to look at the people who create change, social innovators, uh, women, educators, uh, investors, and entrepreneurs. Look at those people and ask them, what are you guys doing, what are you people doing, and what do you think? What do you think about it? Basically trying to get into their heads to think about how do they think about Japan's future and what are they doing to change it? And if they're, if they're successful, Japan will inevitably change into their vision. And that's how, that's my secret to figure out the future. So if you're interested in figuring out a country's future, talk to hundreds of people who are changing the country now, and you'll know where the country is going in the future. So um, I think I'll just leave after that. You don't need anything else, right? Um, so anyway, uh, uh, so, so I really appreciate and, uh, you having me here. Um, um, Please uh, uh, be patient with my terrible jet lag today, <laughs> and I will turn it over to Professor Yamanaka. Thank you very much. I'd like to start my presentation from this slide. Do you know her? Who knows her? She is 
Takahashi Minami, AKB48. AKB48 is a Japanese idol group, and she's Minami Takahashi, very popular. And she's so much impressed with this strawberry. Why is that? Taste, smell, the beautiful uh, shape. Do you know how much is this strawberry? Only one strawberry costs 10,000 yen. 10,000 yen. Do you know that? Do you know where it is? 1,000 yen. 1, 000, oh, sorry, 1,000 yen. Sorry. 1,000 yen. <laughs> sorry. I made a mistake. <laughs> 1,000 yen. <laughs> 1,000 yen. And do you know who raised this strawberry? And where is this born? This strawberry was born in Yamamoto in Miyagi Prefecture, tsunami-affected area. Let me start my story from here. Okay, this is what happened in Yamamoto. Yamamoto is at the 40 minute by driving from Sendai city. And the area was devastated by tsunami after the earthquake, okay? It was a famous place for strawberry farming, but 90%, more than 90% of the strawberry facilities were destroyed by tsunami. And there are several people who wanted to restore that strawberry farming. They are the management team. The founder and CEO, Mr. Hiroki Iwasa, Globis MBA. He, he was raised and uh, he was born and raised in Yamamoto. And he was managing an IT company when he experienced the earthquake. And after the earthquake, he was so sad about the devastation of strawberry farming. So he decided to go back to Yamamoto and established a new company, GRA, together with Yohei. Yohei Hashimoto, uh, his background is not agriculture, his background is nursing care, but he lost his daughter by tsunami. The daughter was killed by tsunami, and the daughter loved strawberries so much. So that is why he decided to focus on strawberry farming after the disaster. Together with Mr. Taratsugu Hashimoto, He's a 40-year veteran of strawberry farming. After the disaster, of course, his facility was wiped away. He decided to retire from strawberry farming, but Hiroki and Yohei persuaded him to join his team and to transfer his knowledge to this new way of strawberry farming. That was how the project was started. And I'm not here to talk about a strawberry. I'm not here to talk about AKB48, uh, but I'm here to talk about the social entrepreneurs and the impact investors, social investors who are driving the movement for social entrepreneurs. That's the topic for me today. So social and entrepreneurship and investment is today's topic. And I will let's spend the next couple, uh, 20 minutes or so on this topic. What is happening in Japan? And I also talk about what is happening in the world briefly. But before that, let me introduce myself, my background. Uh, again, my name is Reggie Yamanaka. Uh, my, I studied my career from Canon, experienced venture capital investing in Apex Globus Partners and Globus Capital Partners, affiliated with Globus Group. And I, was so, I had a, so much passion in healthcare area, so I decided to jump into a healthcare startup. I experienced two healthcare startups. And after that, I experienced the earthquake, and Globis assigned me to establish a new course called Tohoku Social Venture Program. So that is the timing when I decided to rejoin Globis as a faculty, not as an investor. But Kibo Foundation decided to make a new impact investment fund, so I decided to lead the project of Kibo Foundation together with my colleague that I will later explain, later introduce. That's my background. Okay, first of all, I would like to talk about what is the impact entrepreneurs and impact investors in the world and in Japan. And after that, I will explain what is Kibo's approach on the impact investment. What is happening about social entrepreneurship in the world? Of course, I think all of us know that social entrepreneurs are increasing. We are all are uh, impressed by uh, Muhammad, Mr. Muhammad Yunus, that kind of social entrepreneurs, very popular. Uh, we all know that. But I think these statistics may be particularly inter interesting for many of you. This is what is happening in Harvard Business School. 
study the number of students who enrolled in social enterprise courses or research projects increasing dramatically. Uh, for your information, there are 900 students in each year for Harvard Business School. So about two-thirds of them are taking some courses in this area. And these numbers are the number of participants in social enterprise career program, including the summer internship. And I was actually one of them when I went to Harvard Business School in 2003. I was assisted, financially assisted by Harvard Business School to experience the internship in a Christianity organization, uh, elderly care facility in Pittsburgh. That was my background. But you can see how the business people's attention is moving to social sector. It's a dramatic move in the past uh, 20 years. Then what about the investor's side? Of course, there are many social entrepreneurs and there should be many social investors who assist their approach. I would like to explain two key words. Okay, one is venture philanthropy. And the second one is impact investment. Okay. Venture philanthropy means, I will come back to the former slide later on, but let me explain that venture philanthropy means the hands-on investment and the so seeking for the social return. Hands-on investment is a technical term of venture capital industry. Okay? They not only make the investment, but they are engaging into the management. They are involved into the management and support strongly to scale their business. That is the hands-on approach of investment. So both venture philanthropists and impact investors take, are taking that approach. Venture philanthropists are seeking for social return so do the impact investors. But impact investors also seek for financial return as well. That's the difference between impact investor and venture philanthropists. And venture philanthropy, sorry, was started around the year 2000. As far as I know, the first one is the New School. New School was founded by uh, Mr. John Doerr, who is a legendary venture capitalist in the U.S. And it is a special fund for the economic uh, education reform in the U.S. So they took the venture capital type approach for scaling the nonprofit uh, social purpose organization for, that contributes for the economic reform in the U.S. That was a starting point. And the year 2001, Acumen Fund was established. Acumen Fund was of course seeking for social change. I mean, they are, ta they are supporting the entrepreneurs who tackles with poverty. That's their theme. But also, they are seeking for financial return as well. But they are not redistributing, they are uh, reinvesting the financial return to the new social entrepreneurs. That was their approach. Rather than to distribute the uh, financial return to the original funder, they don't do that. That was Acumen Fund. In the year 2002, Bridges Ventures appeared in the UK. In the UK. They are also an impact investor, led by Sir Ronald Cohen. And in the year 2007, the technical term impact investment appeared for the first time. In the year 2013, the Prime Minister David Cameron of the UK established, initiated the establishment of impact G8 Social Impact Investment Task Force to spread the impact investment movement to the world. And the chairman became, uh, chairman was Sir Ronald Cohen, who established uh, Bridges Ventures in the UK. That was what happened in the world on a micro level. And what about the amount of investment? You may be surprised to see these statistics, but the amount of invested amount and on an annual basis used to be 50 billion US dollars in the year 2009. And the size became 10 times. It is expected to be 10 times in the year 2019. Can you see how dramatically the volume of impact investment has increased? It's easy, it is increasing. It is a very drastic movement. What about the return? Of course, impact investment seek for financial return as well, as well as social impact. So what about financial return? They are making money. I'm surprised to see these statistics, but the average net IRR 
Net IRR is the IRR of the fund after deducting the management fee. It is about 7%, which is not bad because the average IRR of venture capital and private equity in the world in the same period of time is 8%. So it is comparable financial return that they are gaining. That is what is, what is happening in the world. Then, what is happening in Japan? I'd like to start talking about micro level, and then after that I will talk about macro things. Okay? On a micro level, the word ethic, this organization is very, played a very important role. Ethic used to be a, a venture supporting nonprofit organization. They started the internship of uh, college students for uh, startups, for entrepreneurial ventures. But recently, they are more focused on social entrepreneurship. They try to promote the social entrepreneurship. And they started the education program for incubating the social entrepreneurs. Social Venture Partners, that is a mentoring organization for assisting the social entrepreneurs. And in the year 2009, two important organizations were born in Japan. One is Japan Fundraising Association. They studied the education and training program for fundraisers in Japan, uh, for nonprofit social purpose. And the second one is Arun. Arun is the very first impact investment organization. But they are making the investment into foreign countries for assisting foreign, foreign uh, uh, country uh, development rather than uh, Japan domestic investment. Is there a person? I heard that there is a, not here yet, but the founder of the Arun may be coming here today, okay, later on. And there are several other uh, venture philanthropy organizations appeared, especially after the earthquake disaster. Our uh, Mitsubishi Corporation created a very powerful fund, Mitsubishi Corporation Disaster Relief Foundation. They have the, the amount of the fund, the size of the fund was $100 million, 100 million US dollars, yen. And they uh, made uh, the investment into uh, facility based uh, assets. Uh, restoration of hotels, restoration of the fishery ships, and so on. So they played a very important role. Japan Venture Philanthropy Fund was established. A Nikkei newspaper, the Japanese major media, uh, started to promote uh, the, the social entrepreneurs in Japan through awarding. And in the year 2014, G8 Impact Investment Task Force Japan Advisory Committee was started. So this is how the trend in the world transferred into the trend in Japan. That was micro level story. What is happening on a macro level? What is happening in Japan? This is my observation. In the past, two worlds were totally different. But it seems to me that two worlds are, are encountering with each other. That's my observation. What are those two worlds? One is the social entrepreneurs, another one is the, impact, the investors community. Typical social entrepreneurs in the past in Japan are a very small volunteer group. They didn't have the intention to scale. They didn't have the intention to maximize their impact traditionally. And of course, the venture capital investors are not interested in making investment into them. Totally different world. They are focused on the investment into IT, uh, web service, that kind of uh, companies that has a high profit growth potential. Some ex uh, rare examples is the biotech startups that is more uh, mission-driven biotech startups, maybe the rare exception. They can be the target of venture capital investors, but that's not a typical one. Then what is happening recently? My observation is that, especially after the disaster, especially in Tohoku area, Hiroki Iwasa is a typical example. Some of the social entrepreneurs are expanding very rapidly. And they are trying to expand their business very aggress aggressively so that they, are, they can maximize their social return rapidly. Okay? And some investors are paying more attention and start to make the investment in supporting those impact entrepreneurs. And as a concrete example, uh, Hiroki Iwasa of GRA raised $4 million raised $4 million from Inc.J. Inc.J. is an innovation of Japan 
uh, Innovation of Japan Corporation, that is a government-sponsored uh, venture capital arm in Japan, and NEC. They made the investment into GRA. So that kind of social entrepreneurs are emerging in Japan, and the money, new flow, inflow of money is appearing. And Kibo Foundation is trying to play a role here. In this context, Kibo Foundation has established the impact investment arm. Now let me explain, first of all, what is Kibo Foundation? And then what is uh, Kibo Foundation's impact investment approach? Uh, how many of you are, have heard about the name Kibo Foundation? Okay, okay, good, thank you very much. Kibo Foundation was established in March 14th in the year 2011. Okay. Uh, it was led by Yoshi Hori, the founder of Globus Group. He and his friends came together here in, in Kojimachi. And then they discussed, what can we do? What can we, there should be something that we can do for the disaster relief uh, purpose. Then what can we do? They studied the activity and they raised uh, about one million dollars in total from 1,500 people. There are many global students who donated some amount of money for this foundation. And uh, Kibo Foundation provided to more than 100 uh, organizations that are active in tsunami affected area. Kibo Foundation also believe in the power of event that connects people and people. So uh, they created uh, continuously held various events, networking events, and a presentation event for social entrepreneurs. And yeah, 44 events that connect the strong heart and heart of social entrepreneurs. That was the activity of Kibo Foundation so far. And Kibo Foundation is starting the impact investment. What was the trigger for this new movement? The trigger was again, Sir Ronald Cohen. The, the chairman of G8 impact, Social Impact Investment Task Force. He's actually the founder of a famous private equity investor called Apex Partners. Apex Partners. And Apex and Globis used to be the business partner. We used to have the joint venture fund called Apex Globis Partners. So uh, the president of Globis, Yoshihori, had the experience of working with, with him. And he came to Japan, uh, talked to Yoshihori, and strongly encouraged that Globus or no, uh, the Yoshihori should restart the impact investment. They should go into the area of impact investment because the experience of venture capital investing helps in the experience of the uh, Sir Ronald Cohen. So that is how uh, Yoshihori studied the feasibility study. I was assigned to do the feasibility study and eventually we reached this conclusion. The conclusion was very simple. Let's believe in their potential. Let's believe in the entrepreneur's potential to make a difference in society. And let's also believe that some of them are so capable that they have the skill to make money. They can, of course, change the world, but also they can make money because we have seen so many talented entrepreneurs in Tohoku area. So that is how we decided, we, we decided to start the Kibo Impact Investment. Now let me explain what is Kibo Impact Investment. The goal, on a micro level, the Kibo's goal is to support entrepreneurs who tackle social problems in Japan and to accelerate their growth. On a more macro level, we want to create a new stream of cash from wealthy people to social entrepreneurs. We want to be successful. We want to be successful not only in social change, but also in making money. If we can prove that we can make money through social investing, then more and more rich people will be more willing to make the investment into the social sector. That's our goal. The fund size is 500 million Japanese yen, about 5 million US dollars. Our investment period will be uh, 20 years. The typical venture capital fund's investment period of time is 10 years, so we are more patient. And we make the equity investment of 100K to 500K. This is the size of the investment. They are the advisors. I'm sorry they are all written in Japanese, but he's from Japan Foundation. He's the top of Japan Fundraising uh, Association. And they are role model type social entrepreneurs in Japan. 
and she's the thought leader in Japan in the social area. And Retsu-san and Miyagi-san have been very active in tsunami-affected area for assisting the social entrepreneurs. So we are very so, so happy to get their insight to start the impact investment in Kibo. Our, we are the investment professionals. And here? And Suzuka is actually seated over there. She had the experience of working uh, at a, uh, Acumen, the global leader of impact investment. She was trained there and dispatched to uh, Nigeria for uh, as, uh, as assisting the management of the social entrepreneur in Nigeria. That's her background. Okay, there are four conditions for our investment. One, the social entrepreneurs needs to be tackling with significant social challenges, significant social problems, such as healthcare, poverty, environmental protection, regional development. As you know, uh, the population aging is a serious problem in Japan. So many rural areas are being devastated due to the depopulation, decline in population. And there are many social entrepreneurs who are trying to turn around the situation. If they could establish a strong model of turnaround, turning around the rural area, then we could spread that model. So we are interested in making investment into that area. We are also interested in the social inclusion of various people. Our business-oriented solution. Uh, we need to see the revenue model establishment. And we need to see that the revenue model is already established for the startup before our investment. Capable management. As we always see for venture capital investing, this is the same. And as for legal entity, the legal entity needs to accommodate the equity investment. In the Japanese structure of legal entity, our non-profit organization cannot issue shares. And investors cannot, make, cannot take the equity of non-profit organization. So we cannot make the investment under the present uh, legal condition in Japan. So we will make the investment into typical corporation, kabushiki gaisha in Japanese. So as a whole, Kibo Foundation will be doing event, grant making, and impact investment. Kibo Foundation was started for disaster relief, but from now on, its domain will expand. And the impact investment will be made not only in Tohoku area, but all over Japan. Okay, that's my explanation about Kibo Foundation. Please feel free to ask questions after uh, my pre presentation and after the dialogue with Devin Sun. Okay. To conclude my speech, I'd like to introduce a speech made by Ms. Kumi Fujisawa. She's one of the advisors of Kibo Foundations. She mentioned, she asked the critical question, are Japanese young people hungry? And the answer was yes. But hungry for what is another good question. She says that they are not hungry for money anymore. They are not hungry for food, typically. But Japanese young people, historically, have been always hungry for what society really needs and what real society really wants. And that is social improvement recently. When you have the chance to talk with Japanese college students recently, you will be surprised to see that many of them, many of them, have the passion to become social entrepreneur in future. That is their dream job for current Japanese college entrepreneurs. Their mindset has changed drastically when compared with that in 10 years ago. My role is to assist them. My role is to help them learn, help them grow as a social entrepreneurs, and to create a new stream of cash to assist their growth. That's my kokorozashi, personal mission. With that, I'd like to conclude my speech. Thank you very much. Uh, Kumi-san, Fujisawa. Uh, she's one of the more than 100 of people I, I interviewed, as well as Konozaki-san, who you, you showed. You met her. Uh, yes, and uh, uh, a lot of familiar faces up there. Uh, and. The, the uh, CEOs that I've been talking to today and yesterday uh, also um, echoed the sentiment that, that Fujisawa-san um, uh, said, which is basically that <clears throat> going to a company 
and working like a slave or a dog. I'm paraphrasing here, you know, these are the words that people use, I'm just reflecting. Being a slave for your entire life and not seeing your family and just trying to accumulate as much money and, 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 and fit in to a system that's kind of uh, not working very well, that has lost any sense of, of appeal for people and particular experiences that um, Japan has faced in the past 10 or 20 years, specific experiences have left imprints on people's psychology. For example, <clears throat> the 2011 earthquake um, basically uh, uh, told a lot of the interviewees that I talked to that you can't necessarily um, you know, depend on tomorrow coming. We might be dead tomorrow, which is a thing that a lot of people said, which is true. We could all be dead tomorrow. So why, why do something with, where the returns are sort of you know, marginal and flat and, and there's long-term suffering rather than um, doing something now to make a, a difference in people's lives? The second thing was uh, the Lehman, what's called the Lehman shock. In, in Japan, I mean, that they looked at f financial people, Wall Street people, as kind of like, oh, these, these poor suckers who uh, you know, lost their jobs and had nowhere to go after the financial crisis. Uh, and and, and if, if, if you take a step back and look at the Japanese experience over the past 20 years, and you have relatively low dynamism and new new businesses and you don't really have a, a global technology um, a hero uh, like a, you don't really I mean a lot of people have been telling me we, we don't have a Steve Jobs we don't have a Zuckerberg yet we also don't have maybe more dynamic growth we don't have a lot of things that that you know that Japan could do possibly so this conclusion of a lot of people is something's got to change it's just not working out and so um, people, I think, uh, from all these, these factors are, are saying to themselves, let's try to do something that has meaning to it. And let's, um, so this is the sort of, this is the intersection, this is where it all comes together in your presentation. A lot of um, what the, the executives and CEOs that I've been talking to are all driven by a social purpose. And it's, it's a combination of wanting to make money, but also wanting to make a difference and change the world. And, and they're all, um, the, the way that they're changing the world has some similarities to it. I mean, it's like, it's really about empowerment of the individual. So for example, I just met with um, the Uber Japan CEO uh, a couple of hours ago. Um, yeah, his, his, his perspective as well as, um, speaking with uh, uh, any, any Times CEO this morning um, and uh, Coiny uh, CEO um, this afternoon, uh, Teach for Japan CEO yesterday and uh, Bibit CEO yesterday. Uh, all these people, the common motif of all these people is, is, is to put power in the hands of individuals and with that there can be a kind of destructive force, creative destruction. And if you want to be very simplistic about it, it's basically increasing the rights and voice and choices of people. So my last uh, project was on womenomics, right, about gender. And if, if you want to uh, ask what the gender issue is about in Japan, it really comes down to maybe one sort of weird thing, which is cutting down the work hours that families are suffering through. so that you know, people can, can divide up labor more equitably, have more choices and so forth, right? So the, 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 there is a sort of tech, technological utopian element of, of um, providing technological uh, solutions to social problems. They can, go, they can go a certain, you know, distance, but not, not the whole distance. It needs, it needs more than just technology, right? It needs, it needs a change of attitude, which I also see happening.
um, long way of asking you a very basic question, which is, what's the cumulative effect of this? The cumul cumulative effect on society. You have social impact, you have, you have increased uh, social entrepreneurship, social impact investing, the philanthropic um, element as well. What do you see as the, the macro changes that might be taking place over time? Well, I'm going to ask a very, in a very qualitative way, but what I see is that we are in the very slow but steady process of chain reaction. What is that, that chain reaction? Many college students are, are wants to become a social entrepreneur, and many of them will be actually social entrepreneurs, very successful social entrepreneurs, and that will be, they will be the new role model for younger people, and those young people will, uh, will actually be the next generation social entrepreneurs. So just like the chain reaction, it is, we are in a very slow but steady process of cumulative social change in that way. That's my observation. Does this answer your question? Okay. By the way, please prepare for asking many questions to him because he's a very, he has a very objective view toward what is happening in Japan. And Japanese people cannot, do not have that kind of objective view. So it is a good chance for you to ask him about Japan. Okay. I, I, I'm, I'm very touched you'd say that, and uh, thank you very much. Because a lot, a lot of people, and, and rightly so, they say, what is this dude from, from Manhattan? Why, why is he running about social change in Japan? It doesn't make any sense. And um, in fact, um, um, uh, Yusuke from um, uh, Teach for Japan yesterday, he, he uh, addressed this issue directly by saying that it's, it's good to have people from outside look at the situation with fresh eyes because sometimes when you're in the middle of the situation, you can't see it as, clear, as clearly or maybe you just see it differently. You know, so it's a different way of seeing things. Sorry to interrupt you. Teach for Japan, do you know the organization called Teach for America? Teach for America is one of the most famous non-profit organization in the U.S. They dispatch our uh, talented, new, uh, just uh, college graduates, uh, just recent college graduates to the schools in the, the less wealthy area, poverty area. That is Teach for America. And Yusuke in Japan is launching the Teach for Japan, the same thing in Japanese uh, context. And they raised fund, interestingly, from Japan Venture Philanthropy Fund. They got the investment, and they are expanding rapidly, right? They are trying to expand rapidly right now. Sorry to interrupt you. What, is, what was your impression when he talked with the, the entrepreneur, Mr. Matsuda, Yusuke Matsuda of Teach for Japan? Um, well, he's, uh, I mean, the, all these people are amazing. You know, they're, they're uh, just incredibly inspiring. But uh, um, my understanding is, is um, they're trying to uh, broaden their, their sources of funding. That's, that's essentially what they're trying to do right now. Uh, they're just, to just getting off the ground. His, his vision is basically, um, so Abe, Abe's approach to addressing the um, inequality in, in, in schooling is to add what he calls like extra, extra opportunities like after school schooling and, and you know, sort of uh, things on top of, on top of, 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 of what you, of, of your baseline, so to speak, you know, you go to, you go to school and that's like constant, that stays constant, and then the government will provide access to, to um, extra schooling. After, uh, and and, and um, Yusuke's critique of that is that, is that that's fine as a short-term Band-Aid solution, and you know, let's give Prime Minister Abe some credit, you know, at least he's aware of the problem. 17% of the country, of the children in this country are below poverty, poverty line. Is that, is that this, the figure, I think? And so um, Teach for Japan's approach is to, is to address the problem at the, at the root of the problem, which is to look at teacher quality, basically. So, um, that, you're, so that your baseline is not uh, static or fixed, that you Im improve the quality of, of um, 
of, of teaching teachers throughout your schooling. And why is because um, according to the studies and the literature that they looked at, um, having a, an inspiring teacher that makes teaching and learning fun is one of the most important experiences you can have for the success of your entire life. I think it should be very challenging for Teach for Japan to persuade the current educators, current school teachers, that accepting new young people would improve the quality of teaching. It should be very challenging to persuade that way. But, you know, Teach for America experienced the same challenge. And they overcame, they have overcome the challenge for the past 20 years effort. So I hope that Matsuda-san will do the same thing in Japan. You made a, um, made a cultural, it's kind of an interesting cultural comment about it. Um, he said that in America, uh, um, <clears throat> you have a, a, a culture in America of, of voice and rights and justice, right? And that's kind of like really American. And that, um, that, that, that poverty and inequality are, are salient and, and fiery issues in the United States. And people say, this is not right, you know? I want to be counted and I want things to change. But he said that in Japan, the Japanese culture um, uh, 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 produces a different situation where the 17% of the people in, in poverty are basically undergoing two things. They're dispersed throughout the population, so they're not, they're not in concentrated pockets. So that's one thing. And the second thing is that their society basically hides them with consent hides them with consent. It's kind of interesting. So for example, um, it's, it's supposed to be an acknowledgement or a reflection of, of human dignity to say, to not necessarily bring attention to your poverty. So it's not necessarily a bad thing, but he said it actually, um, it, it, it is, uh, 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 the metaphor becomes, becomes um, concrete on television where when, if, you're, if you're poor, they pixelate your face mosaic, you know, pixelate, to hide your identity because it's embarrassing. So there's not this um, driving political, fiery, loud, you know, punching voice about poverty. And, and so it's, it's a kind of, uh, it's unaddressed. It's un it's, it exists, but it's unaddressed. And by the way, um, you were talking about the role models, you know, and, and I want to ask the audience actually to think about some some interesting entrepreneurial opportunities in Japan. I'm really curious to hear what, what you all think are the opportunities out there. So think about it, um, and I'll, I'll get right to you. Uh, the, the, um, the role model is very, very, very important. A, a lot of the interviewees um, echoed your point about that. And um, my, my first article about social change in Japan was called um, Japan's Change Generation in Foreign Affairs magazine, and it was about, um, it was about the specific phrase that a lot of people used called nanaroko seidai. Has, has anybody heard that expression? No, sorry. Nanaroko seidai. Nanaroko seidai. Nanaroko seidai. Anybody? No, one person? Two? Three? Four, okay, four, five. We got at least five, okay. So it's not completely obscure. Um, so um, the, the basic idea is that, that people around 1976. Uh, graduated college in? Born. In bo born. Oh, sorry, yeah, yeah. yeah born. 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 It's not like um, the 88th generation. You're thinking of <laughs> Burma, uh, which is, is similar. Um, yeah. it's, it's similar, uh, the Burmese uh, student protests. Mm -hmm. um, but no, these are people who were born in around the early 70s. So it was around um, 76 or earlier, actually. And they're, uh, they're basically my generation. They're Generation X. So I kind of really connect with these guys. You know, they're, they're very, uh, they're kind of skeptical. They're kind of grizzled, you know. <laughs> they're, they have, they have, they're kind of, they're kind of um, a little bit uh, skeptical about what society has produced, you know. And um, uh, uh, this generation, it's basically Japan's Generation X. They're, they're more liberal. They're more cosmopolitan, and they're less uh, uh, greedy about money, and they're they're less money chasing. 
and uh, people have told me that this is basically the first generation that has rejected the baby boom establishment. And so it's the, it's the early 70s or so, and like for example, um, I think Komazaki is, is, in, the, is in that yes, area? Yes, I think so. Right. I and, so. Endo, Maybe for a example, younger. Endo-san um, Endo from, from um, uh, Bibit, for example. Mm. Uh, he has a TEDx talk that mm. you could show next time about um, uh, he, wants to, he, wants to, he wants to make a society that smiles. Uh, and and how, what, how do you do that? Well, he looked at a lot of um, scientific literature and uh, according to the literature that he looked at, the thing that makes people happy consistently is doing work mm -hmm. that helps people. Oh, it's very that's interesting. understandable. Mm -hmm. So he's devoted his career as an entrepreneur to um, creating meaningful work for his employees and, and for his clients. He does user interface consulting. For your information, Nanaroku Seda is a common word uh, because there are so many excellent IT, IT, IT entrepreneurs who were born in around 1976. They experienced the Windows 95 in, when they were a college student. So they had many things to do when they were studying at college. And then, um, and then the, the next generation is, is basically people in their, uh, who were born in the early 1980s. That's, that's basically the people who looked at the Generation X, the, the, the 76ers, as role models. So for example, um, Masami at, at uh, Uber, or um, uh, uh, this, the CE, CFO from um, uh, uh, Anytimes this morning to, that, that I met with today as, as well. So these, these are people who, who, who are very, very clear in saying that, you know, because we've seen that it, it done, we believe we can do it too. And by the way, all these people hang out together too. It's kind of interesting. There's so, there's so few of them, there's about 150. About 150 uh, uh, people um, gather with Komozaki-san um, once a year. Uh, was it Kokoro? Kokoro Zashi? Zashi. Kokoro Zashi. Kokoro Zashi. Group around Komozaki-san. Around Komozaki-san. Yes. Do you know Komozaki-san? Mazaki-san is a social entrepreneur who studied Byoji uh, Hoiku. Byoji Hoiku is a nursery service for sick, sick kids. Sick kids. Usually, uh, the parents cannot use the daycare service when their kids become sick. So they struggled because they cannot go to work. They have to take care of their kids. That was a social problem in Japan. And Komazaki-san tried to change the situation by starting the sick kids-focused daycare service, nursery service. That was the Komazaki-san. He's recognized as a role model of a social entrepreneur in, recently in Japan. How much time? We have only a few minutes left, right? So we should, we should ask the audience to... So I, I, I threw out a, a, a general question about what are you all... I mean, you're all studying to be kick-ass Many, many of them are studying MBAs. So what are, what are some business ideas out there that, that you're working on? Can I ask that? Is it okay? Is it too yeah, general? Yeah, it is okay. Okay. Mm. So what kind of business opportunity are you seeking for in Japan? Is it, that's his interest. Or your, or your own country if you're not from Japan. That's fine too. My name is Daniel Chimizi. I am from Nigeria. Okay, I'm a Globus MBA candidate, uh, full-time. Uh, my goal actually is to set up an institution that will uh, help uh, poor kids across the globe to get free education, because uh, technical education is not so famous, and Japan happens to be a very good country for innovation. So we can really sell this innovation across the globe, not with the aim of only making money, but also to empower lives. Um, by virtue of grace or privilege, I've been privileged to uh, attend programs, uh, most likely freely, in so many innovation centers across the world, Europe. This is my first time to Asia. So I'm also here on scholarship by Globis. So if I'm getting all this support across the globe, I think I should also sacrifice my life to also work for the help of other people across the globe. So I will start with Japan. I'm actually uh, forming some teams already right now. 
and then we will go across the four E's, as I call them, America, Asia, Africa, and Australia. So that's my focus. Thank you. That's Globus student. <laughs> Globus is so much focused on educating, uh, thinking about what is kokorozashi. Kokorozashi means the personal mission. So, yes, so we ask students again and again about what is kokorozashi, what is your kokorozashi, what is your personal mission. So people, the Globus students tend to develop their own kokorozashi before graduating. Hi. I'm almost there, but I haven't really developed mine completely yet. But I'm part of the, the Nanoroku Sedai as well. Um, your, your question is about asking kind of what are the social opportunities out there. I'm looking at three. I'm looking at one for, um, actually for Lixil, because they're, uh, they're, they're trying to find um, a segue into the B2C market, see what are the potential, um, are the current markets that they can help. So like we're looking at things like, um, even just uh, renovating old houses, vacant houses. There's a lot of vacant houses in Japan. There's a migration of, um, of uh, seniors to big cities, and uh, they're leaving all the small towns, right? And you have to ask yourself why they're leaving. They're probably leaving because they, they can't get the, the health care in the small towns. So then but that comes in hand in hand with, uh, I'm not from Jap Japan either, so I kind of have an outside looking in, but I'm, I've been here for a long time. Uh, another thing that that has to do with is um, there's a lot of foreign healthcare workers living outside, like Tohoku. Particularly, we looked at um, Chinese and Filipinos increasingly living in shared houses, right? So that's an, a social opening. Um, and I, I also do, um, but for, for, your, for your class <laughs> on Wednesday, He's taking my class. I'm doing um, an IT-assisted, cloud-driven, crowd-sourced um, kind of mobile-to-mobile uh, it's kind of like Uber for, for, out, for outbound travelers. So, so if, if, I don't think there's time for questions later, but we're, we're looking, how do we get traction from, from social entrepreneurs? You, know, how, you mentioned somebody's trying to, get fun, um, trying, trying to broaden their funding. Uh, De Devin mentioned Matsuda-san is trying to broaden their, their sources of funding. So we're looking at how do we make a noise and how do we get traction from these guys as well. So you can let me know on Wednesday. Okay. Quick answer to that is that measure something. Measure how impactful your activity is. Measure how you are changing the society. Uh, it count something. For example, the number of recipients of your service or uh, how the quality of life is improved by your activity. If you measure that, you can prove that, and that will be the attraction to attract the investor's money. That's a quick, quick answer to your question. Hello, my name is Chloe, I'm from France, and I'm full-time student MBA this year as well at Globus. Um, I don't know yet how long I'm going to stay in Japan, but I'm really interested in crowdfunding. I think there's a big future for crowdfunding in Japan because people are really educated and sensibilized by helping others, helping the community and the group. So it's kind of my idea as well, uh, like how to develop crowdfunding platforms. So, and also how it can influence the social entrepreneurship as well. I think crowdsourcing platform already has, a, has given a very strong impact for the social entrepreneurs. When you see many uh, social entrepreneurs active in Tohoku area, most of them have raised millions of Japanese yen through crowdsourcing, through crowdfunding, I'm sorry. Uh, Hiroki Iwasa of GRA, I think, I believe he raised three million yen or four million yen through crowdfunding. That's the typical pattern. So uh, it's the best method for seed stage funding. Yeah. And after the seed stage, more institutional investors would come in. That will be venture philanthropy or impact investment. So uh, the crowdfunding and those institutional investors will be a good fit, good complementary existence. Uh, thank you for raising that very important question. Thank you. Thank you. I think they have many questions for to ask to ask you. I think we can continue. I think we have until maybe eight thirty or so, and then we can do some.
have yes. snacks. Much time for free discussion. I, I just I want to um, the, the Uber thing because just because I, I just had the chat with the CEO uh, a couple hours ago, um, and um, <clears throat> he's also a very very insightful person. Um, I, I I sort of um, brought up the joke that in America everything is the Uber of fill in the blank, the Uber of food or the Uber of pizza or the Uber of everything, you know. It's like, and it's, it's funny because Uber is a bit controversial too at the same time. And so even in Japan, of course, of all places, um, a place that may be skeptical about foreign ideas, and you know, that's, that's totally natural. <laughs> uh, uh, Masami, who is a Japanese man who um, is the CEO, uh, so he's been profiled in all these magazines. We were talking about this earlier. And um, uh, one Japanese um, economics magazine uh, depicted him basically as Commodore Matthew Perry, uh, uh, you know, bringing the black ships into Japan, which is kind of ironic because he's Japanese, right? Um, but he, he was pointing at the picture of um, the drawing on, on the magazine with a Commodore Perry coming in, and on the other side of the page was a caricature of a, of, of a Japanese person with a telescope looking at the black ship. So it's kind of like, hmm, that's interesting. I'm intrigued. I'm scared, but I'm intrigued. So that, I mean, so Masami was basically saying that, that that's kind of the, um, the general sentiment about things like um, the sharing economy or, uh, a disruptive um, uh, entrepreneurial forces is that Japanese people, I think, are are both a afraid and intrigued. And um, uh, uh, Masami basically said that the the next step is 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 uh, you need a sense of urgency. That you know um, that uh, Japan is is. Um, is, is aware of, of, of the need to change and, and um, may have the capacity to do so, but what's lacking is a sense of urgency. A lot of people have said that. But you know, the 2020 Olympics is actually providing a very, very convenient, very concrete milestone that people could say, wait a second, we need to do this and this and this by 2020 um, for the Olympics. and, and um, Having Uber, according to Masami, is one of those things because a lot of foreigners are going to show up and say, "Where's my Uber?" And if it's not there, you know, it'd be kind of embarrassing. Well, I agree that we need more sense of urgency. And present government, Abe cabinet, is pro entrepreneurs. They are strongly promoting the deregulation uh, steadily. But I think we need the government needs more sense of urgency. I agree with that. Okay, shall we open to the question from the audience? If you have questions, please raise your hand. Hi, my name is Angela. I don't go to school here, but I run a nonprofit and I work in Tohoku. Um, something that I see a lot is the whole idea of social entrepreneurship and investment social action is known theoretically, but the big companies have no idea what to do with it. So they've started CSR, and then they go, and they tell me a lot, like, they always throw, by default, they go, well, it's not in our culture, you know. People still don't know how to, how to donate money, they don't understand it. And there's this demographic of kind of, I don't know, enlightened Japanese and international Japanese that are really, you know, there. Like you said, 150 people gather, but the majority of Japan is still quite behind. And I'm wondering, how do you, th I'm very curious about this disconnect and what are we looking at? And how are the big companies going to actually embrace this? Are they? That's an excellent question. I agree that there is a strong, what, disparity, a strong uh, difference between the younger generation in big corporations and older generation in big, big corporations. Um, there are many social entrepreneur-minded professionals in big corporations, 
typical example is the, the professional in one professional working for NEC, NEC, the electronics company. He was so much interested in the activity of GRA. And he took part in the program. He took part in the activity as a pro bono worker assisting the GRA's activity. And eventually, he persuaded the NEC management to make the investment into GRA. And then he himself was dispatched to the joint venture with GRA. And now he's working to construct the IT system for smart agriculture. So that kind of person does exist. They do exist in Japanese corporations. But it is true that they are not the majority. And they are hidden in the major voice of the majority that says that social entrepreneurship, that has nothing to do with our business. Unfortunately, that is the current major voice for typical large corporation in Japan. I would, I would say that there's, there's um, when I ask a similar question to a lot of these people, when I say, okay, well, that's all very nice and you know, this all makes sense, but when, how is the change going to actually happen? How is it going to be kind of come to a, a fore? You know, how, what's, what's the force going to be? Uh, there are several things, and at least three. Um, one is that um, there's a, a general comment and it, it can maybe received wisdom. Uh, you can be skeptical, and it's good to be skeptical, but a lot of people believe that the, the big companies that don't uh, adapt and, and adopt new ideas are gonna eventually become uncompetitive. There's that idea, that's one. I mean, because if, with, if the Japanese market is shrinking, which it is, then Japanese companies have to be more global, and if they're not competitive, they're, they're gonna lose. The second one is that um, a lot of companies um, in Japan, I understand, are, are investing in entrepreneurial companies that uh, are, are doing things that the bigger companies would like to do, but they don't have the, the capacity, so they're, they're, they're funding smaller companies to do it. Like, for example, GRI, right? GRI is, is one of the ones that are, are funding smaller companies, right? Yes, that's right. Strategic venture investment. Yeah. That is quite common for Japanese large organizations. And the third, and the third one is, um, is, is a demographic change. So a lot of people said, hey, Devin, you know, you, you, you're, you're saying Japan's finally changing. Well, we've heard that before, you know. It, it's, it's, people have been saying that like every five years or so. There's some article that comes out like every five or, or so years written usually by some foreigner who says, it's really changing this time. Well, okay, it's good, yeah. I mean, I agree that you have to be skeptical. It's, it's, but there's something very, very different this time, which is there is an actual specific statistical demographic change happening that will take place by 2017. It's actually between 2017 and 2020, which corresponds with the Olympics. And that is that every person from the baby boomer generation will be retired. They will be 75 years old or older. And um, <clears throat> now what does that mean? That, mean? that means that the Gen X people, like, uh, all the people we've been talking about are all going to be in power of some sort or another. They're going to be CEOs. They're going to be CFOs. They're going to be, um, you know, they're going to be editors in chief. You know, they're gonna, they're all types of things. And so, maybe that might mean that eventually um, the 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 sort of uh, um, seeds of change could could um, could grow into Japanese politics eventually. Eventually, not immediately. I think politics is the laggard. Politics always comes in last. It's usually society, then business and economics, and then politics. By the way, um, something that's relevant to F Fukushima and Tohoku uh, is, is um, one of the interesting comments I heard, it was actually Endo-san uh, said from Bibit. He said, a lot of the, um, these Gen Xers in Japan who are CEOs now and, and are you know doing entrepreneurial stuff and want to change society, they're kind of like um, altruistic, altruistic, and they're not. Um, what was the word he used? They're not. They don't have enough testosterone. That's what, that's what he, that's how he put it. He said that they're they're really full of estrogen. And 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 um, and they they really are full of empathy and they really care about other people, 
and, and they're not like um, they're not like a bunch of scary Wall Streeters. They're not like that. So he said that this is actually a fault of hi, of him and his friends because they're not like ass kickers. You know, they're they're like they're like you know growing good companies and making good relations and making good products and, and making their their clients happy. But they're not like taking names, you know, and and. Um, so what he thinks is that there's another group in Japan that's also powerful. And I would actually say your, fo your founder is one of them. Um, and actually he mentioned uh, your founder, Hori-san, as being um, the type that's the counterbalance to people like Endo-san. So these are kind of people who are like kind of strong, uh, aggressive, and are fighters. And you know, I would call them sort of like, like um, patriotic liberals or something like that, you know, or conservative liberals. And, and um, what Endo-san thinks is that we need the Endos and the Hodis to team up together. And then that will change Japan. And the people who are the Hodis and, and, and the um, uh, uh, people like that, he had, gave me a list of people who are like that, will be the ones who go into politics because they, they can fight with the elbows in politics. Kind of interesting. interesting. And he said, um, you know, where, if you want to go find those people, he said, if you want to go find where those, those future leaders are of Japan, they're, in all, they're in to, all in Tohoku right now. He said, because like, you know, when, when the earthquake struck, all these macho first responders, these kind of warriors, these moral warriors, they all ran into Tohoku to help. And they're the... Um, he believes that, that these are the people that, that have the, the guts to, and, and they're women too, obviously, um, uh, uh, to, to be the, the ones who can, can fight in the dirty sport of politics. That's interesting, very interesting, and that is true. And that, and that was also true when Japan experienced big earthquake in 1995. There was a huge Hanshin earthquake. And at that time, many volunteer leaders rushed into the uh, Hanshin area, Kobe. So the same thing is happening in East, Great East Japan earthquake, I think. Other questions? Yes, uh, yes you. Uh, regarding this party, I also have uh, one topic I strongly uh, to. I would like to strongly to ask you. Uh, it is about educational disparity. So I think these days the uh, news says that there is very strong correlation between uh, the parents' earnings and between the uh, one's academic background, and also this happen. Uh, this causes the vice. Uh, by circulation or uh, for people, mm. and also, uh, but meanwhile, I think there is a big uh, evolution in technology. So this is IT education is uh, now it's coming. So maybe it could be the very good solution for that problem. And also, this is that opinion. Even though uh, there is no. Uh, IT solution or uh, any other opportunities for children like Juku or so. Uh, but uh, I think that's uh, uh, depending on the area, I think there's culture to study by myself. So what I want to uh, know is that uh, as a Japan watcher, uh, I'd like to know your opinion regarding how to solve the uh, educational disparity and what would be the key to solve that Problem. Thank you. Do you think that, yeah? Well, yeah. <laughs> Man, I mean, because Yusuke's answer to that question really was very nuanced and sophisticated. So I, I feel like I should, I should show you my notes afterwards, if that would be okay, because they're, they're very compl complex, his answer. But if I could summarize, he, he, his basic point was that. Um, Teachers uh, need to be, teach, I mean, teachers in Japan need to be engaged with students, 
not just facing the blackboard and going through the, the motions and ignoring the students. You know, that was that was that was basically the, the summary. And um, the other thing that was kind of interesting is is um, he he. Yusuke kind of described the life of a teacher in Japan, which is horrible, um, because they, they spend 60, at least 60 hours a week working, uh, which is the highest, I believe, in the OECD. One of the highest. One of the highest. And uh, why? Why is that? Because they, they, uh, the, the teacher uh, takes on all the roles of the uh, school system. So it's the teacher is the teacher. Um, they oversee the students cleaning after lunch. They um, meet with the parents and do the sort of rec receiving critiques. Uh, they fill out the uh, forms for the Board of Education. They do everything. So they're kind of like one person bands. You know, they, do, they do it all. You know? And so there's, there's a lack of, of having to collaborate and collaboration is a very important skill in the 21st century globalized economy, right? So it was funny because when Yusuke said, you know, what we need is, um, is, uh, is more collaboration from teachers. And when he said that, as an American, I was like, huh? Well, well isn't that kind of, I mean, why aren't they collaborating, you know? But he, he, so he explained, you know. If you think about the life of a, of a teacher in Japan, um, they are, um, uh, uh, have uh, uh, increased uh, episodes of mental disorders. Uh, there's all kinds of statistical evidence that it's not sustainable. So uh, addressing those problems is, is really the key. I hope that answers. Sure. Other questions? Hello, hi. Uh, my name is Leo. I'm a student right now in the full-time MBA program. Um, Devin San, okay. Uh, you mentioned that you were able to talk to many of the people who are trying to change Japan, all right? Now, um, I'm, I'm sure by talking to them, you're seeing some common themes, all right? I guess my question would be, um, based on everything that's gonna happen, what's, what's if you, if, you can, if you can look at Japan as pressing a lot of the right buttons in order to change, what is the button that they should press right now? And the way, another way to answer this is, how can we help them? So do you mean, you mean in terms of, you mean just very generally speaking? Well, what is the priority right now that where change can happen? Because, you know, it needs, a lot of things need to happen, right? But where, where, what is the, based on what you're seeing, which is the number one button they need to press in order to change Japan? Or what help do they need to do that? Yeah, that's a big one. <laughs> that's huge. Key driver for Japan social change. Key driver, right now. The right now, the or even, one, even one that's accessible right now, the most successful or the lowest hanging fruit. I don't know. Successful. I okay. Well, I think I think I think the thing that's most successful is when um, a person like Osakabe-san, who is uh, she was the woman who coined the term matahara, maternity harassment, which which means um, uh, pregnancy discrimination. It's it's uh, the so in America we call it the pregnancy discrimination. In Japan, they call it maternity harassment, Matahara. Yeah. So she uh, started an organization called Matahara.net, and out of her apartment in Kawasaki, where I visited her. Um, and the key is she, people like like her, people like Komozaki-san, Florence MPO, uh, people like uh, Masami at Uber uh, Japan. The, the thing that they're doing is they're basically addressing a social need and they're, um, they're not taking no for an answer <laughs> and they're, um, they're educating the public and they're finding political allies. It's very important. So they make, um, they make friends with ministers in the, in the cabinet and they often find um, uh, um, what they call champions, so that specific politicians will become their allies in, in the government. And so um, 
then change can come in from many different levels. So um, uh, Osakabe-san, she um, she created a, a, a term that over you know overnight became the word of the year, Matahara, in 2014, I think it was it was word of the year, and. Um, uh, so there's a kind of a public education and perception change. Then there's the sort of um, uh, 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 being fearless thing. So it's like, you know, doing it, you know, like Komazaki-san, he did the same thing. His, his original idea was let's use idle apartment space as micro nurseries to help their fathers, these fathers and these mothers who are desperate for nurseries. Right? It's a desperate family situation going on in, in Japan. So Komazaki-san, he's like this handsome hero. You know, comes in and says, like, "I'll save you." You know, I'll just you know use this leftover space. It's like he's, he thinks like an economist. You know, it's a very economic approach. Used idle spaces. You know, it's like very. Um, it's like what uh, what factories do. You know, they they trade um, uh, uh, idle idle plant um, equipment and. Uh, uh, the government said, "The government said, no, you can't do that um, because that would hurt the incumbent monopolies that are the big nurseries. So it's against the rules. You, you can't, you can't do that." And Komazaki said, "You know what? I'm going to do it anyway." And I was like, "You, you are awesome." You know, so he didn't take no for an answer. He just said, I'm going to do it anyway. And he did it, and he proved to the government that it's good. And the government said, okay, you're on to something here. I, I, I'll concede that you're right. And uh, Abe changed the national law to support him. So it's these kinds of um, stories that you know. It's, I hope that's you know. It's kind of a complicated answer. It's, well, it's, yes. <laughs> yeah. So if it's okay, can I clarify? Okay, so it seems to be three things. Number one, are you saying women's issues? Number two, are you saying change the public perception first? Or number three, are you saying we need more mavericks? I think more mavericks is, is um, cause I actually wrote an article called we need more mavericks. <laughs> it's in the Huffington Post. <laughs> um, so, I, I, but it's, it's a combination. It really is a combination. Okay. Yeah, and um, are, are you Filipino? Yes, I am. Yeah. I mean, the Philippines has such an incredible uh, political culture, you know. Um, so you should bring your Filipino sense sentimental sentiment, and 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 bring the fire here, because they got the fire there. Right. Or social change. Thank you. Yeah, they need it. Last question. Okay. Uh, thank you for the presentation, uh, dialogue. Uh, I'm Hiroki, uh, working in Jansen Jansen Group. And uh, uh, my uh, question is to uh, uh, about a uh, most difficult point uh, in the process to start uh, social uh, uh, for social entrepreneurs. Uh, and um, uh, in my uh, desire uh, to solve an uh, issue uh, is uh, uh, continuous medical education for medical doctors for uh, Japan, Japanese uh, doctors. Uh, and I uh, doing with uh, as a CSL with uh, companies uh, money, uh, but I, uh, it's not to uh, continue as uh, uh, pharmaceutical company, uh, then I want to uh, doing uh, by myself if I, I could. So uh, I want to uh, ask uh, both of you about the difficulties of the process and and uh, uh, if uh, it, there is, uh, I want to uh, ask you also an uh, example for the successor. I'm sorry for long. Can I go first? Because my answer is is is, um, is naive. Because you're actually an expert on this on this. So um, I'll just I'll just I'll just I'll just um, repeat what I heard other people say. Uh, so I asked that question um, to some uh, CEOs, 
And um, because there's an explosion of, of new funding recently, um, it started from a low point, it's, it's, it's um, quadrupled recently, the amount of funding available for, for startups. Uh, but um, uh, the, I asked the question, okay, so if, if it's not funding, then what is the challenge? And I heard that it was really about um, putting together a team that shares your vision. And it's kind of like a management question. You know, management, managing people is probably one of the most difficult things you can ever do, so it's a safe answer. Um, and I actually thought of a good answer for you, finally. <laughs> um, so as outsiders, uh, a lot of the people um, told me in Japan, keep doing what you're doing, which is, you know, giving, um, giving credit and, and acknowledging and, and, and support to the people who are changing Japan. You know what I mean? So um, writing about them and, and, and uh, helping them meet new people and, and, and meet, uh, expand their networks and so forth and giving them moral support. I, I, I was very, very touched to hear that so many of the innovators that I interviewed said, uh, you know, the fact that you're writing about us means so much to us. Please keep doing it. You know, it's, it's, it's a very simple thing, but we can, you know, we have a role to play. Yeah. Uh, I understand that it is very challenging to fundraise for social purpose activities. And I think money, establishment of good business model, I mean, revenue, revenue model, is the, one of the biggest challenges for social entrepreneurs. And how should, can we overcome those challenges? Well, I recommend that you should take a small step or small action and concrete track record to prove your commitment and your impact. Uh, for example, let me raise the example of uh, Karizawa International. Karizawa International is a, an international school, leader training a school established by Ms. Rin Kobayashi. She needed to have, she needs to have a 10 million US dollars for establishing the new school, but she really, really wanted to create the new school. And what she did, she raised fund, she tried to raise the fund, but she couldn't. Nobody was willing to give her 10 million dollars with, no, with a person who had no track record at all. Then she decided to create a small summer camp accepted many international students for only the summer camp without any building, okay? And then she provided an excellent leadership training. Then only after that, the investors or wealthy people understood her commitment and her impact. And after that, she could raise $10 million. So taking such a small step and small track record would be a very important first step for proving your commitment and your impact. That's my advice, but I, I'm sure that you are the, yeah, your uh, team, uh, continued education for medical doctors is a very important topic for uh, Japanese healthcare in healthcare. So I hope that you will be, you will keep doing that and you will be successful. Last question. I have a question to Devin san it's so impressive that you've met more than 100 Japanese change makers. Thank you so much. However, I guess they are so active, excellent, English fluent, Japanese minority, not majority like she said. There are still some silent majority who believe nothing changes, it's the best thing. And they tell their children that social entrepreneurs, what are you talking about? Go to a big company and earn stable payment. And that, that's the reality of our society. I tend to focus on really nice and active, good minority change makers, but I also know that I have to face with these majority people. Would you give us some advice how, how I could deal with them strategically and how, because we, we have to, we also have to, we want to change them, but they don't appreciate any changes. There's an there's a, uh, expression we like to use, which is enlightened self-interest. So I think number one is first show them respect. You have to show everyone respect, of course. I, mean, I know you do that. Number two um, is, is to maybe play uh, or um, talk to what we call their enlightened self-interest. And what, what I mean by that is that um, 
uh, a lot of the people who have been starting up companies recently have been telling me that one of the reasons that they're doing this is so that they can have a career for the rest of their lives and not be a uh, fired cubicle worker with no skills. So it's kind of a paradox, you know, but lifetime employment is gone. You know, corporate um, um, uh, security is gone. We live in a very uncertain and ins unstable world. And the way to um, accumulate skills um, that are useful in many different, uh, many different, um, you know, sort of circumstances, is to be an entrepreneur, start a business, do something new, you know, try on new things. So, um, uh, you know, it's it's uh, it's maybe showing the benefit of trying 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 out new things. Meanwhile, <laughs> um, it's okay if people, not everyone wants to be a social entrepreneur. That's totally fine. I mean, what's the actual percentage of real entrepreneurs in, in, in a population? What is it, like 5% or something? It's going to be, that's okay. So it's, you know, and the other thing is, um, it's okay if not everyone is a liberal cosmopolitan elite. That's also okay. Um, that's just how it is in the world, you know. The world is like that. And, and that you know, Japan's not unusual that way. But my 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 hunch, my 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 bet, is that if you look at history, <clears throat> the um, the people in populations who are the change makers uh, are the ones who are usually um, uh, toward progress, not not the evil ones. There are evil change makers too, but the good change makers. They tend to be optimistic, very smart, well connected. They embrace technology. They're good at fundraising, and guess what? They're, they tend to be successful. The 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 people who embrace progress, social progress, technological progress, and so forth, are generally generally successful throughout history. And that doesn't necessarily mean that you have a have to have a hundred percent converts in in your population. You can have a small elite that busts through the, the status quo. Um, and that's, um, that's part of the process of change. Yeah. Now is the time to close. So thank you all. Thank you very much for asking great questions. And thank you, for David, for sharing your insight. Thank you very much.